My name is Sara Isakovic. Uh, most of Slovenia know me for winning a silver Olympic medal in Beijing 2008. Uh, but the past 15 years, I've been swimming in, in another field of life, and that is a field of performance psychology. So now I work as a psychologist, and I, um, my job is really to make people's life easier. So either I optimize their daily performance so that they can be as productive, as confident, confident as motivated, as uh, emotionally stable as possible so that they can really be their best every day or I prepare them for an optimal performance that is to come. And these are usually various different kinds of performers. So that's what I do today. But yeah, like uh, you said, um, it's maybe strange to see uh, an Olympic athlete, you know, now dive into this uh, psychology field. But for me, it was a very easy transition because I always understood as an athlete this power of my mind. I always knew how important it is to train my, my brain as much as my body because if my mind wasn't stable, if it wasn't focused, if I didn't know how to regulate my attention, if I didn't know how to stay emotionally stable, if I didn't know how to train my confidence or keep up my motivation, there are no results. And I knew this every single day, 20 years of my swimming career, swimming up to 16 kilometers a day. So I, I just knew that my, my head had to be in the right place for my body to perform, whether it was in a daily training environment or at Olympics. So for me, I, was, I understood it, I practiced it, and I said, now I want to share this knowledge and experience with other people as well, because everybody deserves it. What's more fulfilling? Yeah. Well, so it's a very different career, of course, because in, as an athlete, I'm just focused on myself, right? I am trying to be the best I can mentally and physically every day to perform at my best level. Um, so it's all about me, right? I take care of myself, I sleep, I eat, I train. Um, and I have to say that, you know, it, as, as fun as it is to be a high-performing athlete, it's a very, very, very demanding um, uh, way of life because everything has to be organized so that I rest, I eat, and I perform, right? So I would say, I mean, I mean more fun. There's nothing more thrilling than being an Olympic athlete mm -hmm. because I don't get to have that level of excitement where I'm on the blocks you know, getting ready to perform. So that, that part of, of sports life I miss because there's, it's just when, when the whole pool goes silent and the only thing I hear is take your marks, I know now I'm diving into a battle with myself and the other swimmers around me and that's so exciting. But the, nobody sees what's behind the curtain. So now this lifestyle is more... Um, <laughs> it's not that intense, but I do enjoy my job because I get to help others. And what I find fulfilling is whatever I share, my knowledge, my experiences, when I get to train people to build a resilient mindset, it's really fulfilling because I know I'm making a difference in the world. So both are exciting, but high level sports is much more difficult. Yeah. That's why I feel life is easy now, because I don't have to, yeah, train as hard physically as I did before. So, um, I was always the kind of an athlete who loved going to school. I. I am, I'm a big geek, I love learning, I love studying, and um, somehow throughout my life my parents always encouraged me to pursue academics while, while training. So there was no option for me, even as, as you might know, but the sport of swimming, you can't really make a living out of it like a tennis player maybe would at that level, um, so that you don't make a living out of swimming. Um, so for me it was very important to develop myself outside of the water as well. And, you know, find out about my interests. 
Um, and as soon as I went to uh, university in, in Berkeley in the US, uh, straight after Beijing Olympics, I figured, wow, there's this whole world of psychology and performance psychology that I get to study and do brain research. So then all of a sudden swimming was not such a priority anymore. And I, I realized I was like, there's so much more for me to explore, to learn. You know, I've done the swimming, now I can move on. And I was really ready to move on. So the only reason for stopping my swimming career that young is because I wanted to do other things in life. Yeah. So you fell in love uh, in psychology, yes, right? Yes, I fell in love with it because I think there's so much room for, you know, improvement in, in this field and, and to help people develop so that overall they can be healthier. Yeah, it's a big love of mine. And I love now being on stage and, and lecturing. And so I'm in a, instead of performing in the water, I'm performing on stage. Yeah. Yeah, so aviation psychology was always my main focus, even in my master's degree and all the other, um, you know, certification programs that I went through because I was very interested in pilots' performance under stress. My father is an examiner, an instructor. He works for Boeing, um, so he, you know, teaches pilots how to fly. He was also a pilot his whole life. My brother is a pilot. Uh, my grandparents in Serbia my uncles, everybody, everybody. My mother was a flight attendant. <laughs> so everybody's in the, in, in the world of aviation. And for me, every time my father came home from a flight or from a simulator exam, we would analyze pilot's performance. And for me, you know, he would analyze it from a technical, tactical, uh, you know, kind of knowledge-wise perspective. But we would always talk about psychology because pilots, no matter how ready they are, how much knowledge and experiences they have, there's the stress aspect that can take over. And for pilots, it is very important to stay as mentally as stable as possible, to really have a calm mind, to have the mental clarity, to see a bigger picture of what's going on. And as soon as stress takes over, physical and mental, it blocks, it blocks the cognitive capacity for a pilot to perform optimally. So no longer are they able to see the big picture, but they have a tunnel vision and maybe they're fixated on a problem that's not even the problem. Maybe they can't hear the, the commands of the um, flight controllers because they're so stressed they can't hear. Maybe they're instinctively reacting, you know, uh, and let's say the last two Boeing uh, air crashes. All pilots know that if, for example, you want... If you want the, the airplane to have speed and if the airplane is falling, you need to bring the nose down to get, gain speed and stay in the air. Whereas pilots under stress instinctively react and are keeping the airplane up. And the more they're keeping the nose up, the faster it's falling. Right. So it's an instinctive react, reaction to stress that pilots need to need to control. Otherwise, quick mistakes happen and then hopefully not. But. You know, it ha an accident also happens and it's a result of the human factor, most of all. So my job is how do I train a pilot to, in those moments of performance, stay so conscious and so aware of what's going on that the stress doesn't block their capacity to perform so that they're able to manage themselves first. How to stabilize the body, the nervous system, how to stay calm, how to, you know, take from their memory everything they know and not react in instinctively because that might be fatal. Um, so I love aviation just for that fact or just because it's one of those jobs where people need to be at their best every day. They have 500 passengers in the back and they're human just like all of us. So yeah, I still do work with pilots. It's one of my favorite categories to work with.
Yeah, so most of my laboratory experience when it comes down to brain research was in San Diego, where I was um, in an amazing environment where we explored neural mechanisms of resilience, which means that we were looking at so structurally the structure and function of the brain through an fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging. We were looking at inside the brain, structurally and functionally speaking, what makes a human resilient to stress? How are they able to anticipate stress better, manage it, and then recover from it? So we were looking at, in my lab, what's, what's that one characteristic of resilience in the human brain? And we, we down, it comes down to research, of course, and results. <laughs> it's all, you know, based on uh, empirical evidence. It comes down to one simple thing, and that is awareness. So the more aware an individual is, but this is called interoceptive awareness. So that means I am noticing changes within my mind and body as I'm exposed to stress. I am aware of myself. I'm noticing my breathing. I'm noticing my attention wandering away. I'm noticing tension in my body. So the more aware I am, the more conscious, the more, let's say, awake, alert, present. The more aware I am, the better I'm able to respond to stress. Because if I'm not aware, and this is a, we, we were looking at, if somebody is interested in neuroscience, we were looking at insula, insular cortex. Kind of, we call it the center of interoceptive awareness. And the more I can notice changes within my mind and body, the faster I can respond. Because if under stress, I'm not noticing how my breath is shallow, how I'm holding tension in my chest. If under stress, I'm not noticing tension in my body, I can't change it because I'm not even aware that it's happening, right? So the whole, what we did in, in our lab, we, we worked with Navy SEALs, Marines, Olympic athletes, extreme performers, even college campus students, and we put them through an eight-week mindfulness training program. So our foundation of training resilience was through mindfulness training. So, right, because I'm talking about this awareness. What is this awareness? Awareness simply means paying attention. And to train the awareness muscle in the brain, you have to practice mindfulness. So then we put all these individuals through an eight-week mindfulness training course, and we scan their brain pre- and post-training. And even though the Navy SEALs, of course, their baseline is already very resilient, they, they elevated their resilience even more. Because the more conscious they were of themselves, the better they were to self-regulate. Right? So if I'm aware of what's happening to my body, I can respond and I can self-regulate. And if I can regulate myself under stress, I can manage any situation I'm in. And I, I understood this as an athlete. I, I, I knew this every day because if I don't regulate my internal environment, if, I'm not, if I don't know how to regulate my attention, where it is, to ask myself, where am I? If, you know, if my mind wanders away to complaints, excuses, doubts, and worries, immediately I lose focus on what I'm meant to be doing. So at Olympics, for example, there's no other way but to be present in that moment. Because one single thought about the future, one single thought, causes tension in my face. And with that tension in my face, I'm no longer able to breathe as smoothly. And because I'm not breathing as smoothly in the water, I swim three hundredths of a second slower. And in swimming, if you swim three hundredths of a second slower, it's Olympic medal or not. So I had to be very aware of my body, very aware of my thoughts, of my emotions. Why? Because that's the only way I can regulate them. So in the lab, what I'm trying to say, we were looking at how training mindfulness, training awareness, raises that level of resilience. Simply because when one is more aware, the better ability they have to self-regulate.
Yeah, yeah. So a part of this um, group of people that we were researching was not only um, Navy SEALs and Marines, but also Olympic athletes. So I did a study with, with swimmers. Um, so I brought in a lot of you know swimmers and we were also doing the same training. Uh, we did extreme performers as well. There was an, there was extreme, like there, an athlete, a swimmer who does extreme swimming distances, Diana Nyad. Mm -hmm. So we had her in the lab. And then we also have the BMX, BMX bike riders, you know, the, the BMX, yeah. So we trained the whole BMX national team in mindfulness so that they would perform better mm -hmm. in, in, in their sport. Any top managers? Top managers now, right? So not in San Diego. <laughs> now it's my job. So here, I, you know, I lived abroad most of my life. Now I came back home to Slovenia. So now this is what I do in Slovenia. And I do really mostly work with businesses because people are very, very stressed out. So my job is to make it easier for them. So I was um, mentally coaching um, Natasha Brischke. She was one of our reporters out of Washington, D.C. And she decided to have this Euro-Arabian North Pole expedition. So women, for the first time ever, went on skis and walked 100 kil kilometers um, to, the, to the North Pole. So they were walking, I'm, now I'm, I don't know exactly, but around, you know, um, five, six hours in, in one go and then rest and then again five, six hours until they reached that North Pole. Yeah, so my job was to mentally prepare Natasha for that expedition because um, you can't, I mean, I don't think any of us can imagine how, how it is to be on skis while it's minus 40 outside, how to, you know, quickly prepare the tents, get the drinks, get the... I mean, it's a whole strategy, right? So within that strategy of how to be your best, walking 100 kilometers to that point, you need mental tools how to stay calm. No matter the wind, the cold, the maybe a polar bear coming your way. Um, you know, she was very scared that she's going to be very cold because you can have actually frostbite and it's very dangerous. So mentally, you have to be so in sync with your body that you, you know how to move warmth, warmth through, through the body, right? So if I'm panicking that my fingers are cold, it's very likely that they're gonna, I'm going to get a fright, uh, frostbite faster. So I need to stay calm, learn how to warm up my fingers, how to move attention through my body. Um, so we did a lot of that kind of training, a lot of meditation, a lot of mindfulness for, for her to just stay as calm as possible during all the unpredictable stressors. Yeah, so for me, I have to say that I'm very grateful for the neuroscience background because it gave me an insight of how the brain functions. And if you understand how a part of the body functions, you can then train it, right? So for me, everything is training. I, I'm a huge fan of training. So I understand the way I train any other muscle in my body. That's how I train my brain. And if I understand how it functions, then I understand. I'm like, okay, if this is this is how I can train it, I can shape it, I can mold my brain to help me in times of stress, right? And right now we're talking so much performance, but like you said, it's about health. And if, if with this knowledge, I'm like, this is how my brain works under stress. This is how I can train it. These are the exercises. And if I stick to just a few basic exercises a day, I can help myself, you know, my body be more at calm or at ease. I know how to regulate my nervous system so that it's not constantly in the sympathetic nervous, you know, sympathetic nervous system mode, but I know how to, you know, re regenerate, that I actually get to relax. People don't even know how to relax anymore because they're constantly stressed. Stress, 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 stress. They're breathing shallow instead of deeply with the diaphragm. 
there's holding tension and this tension can eventually lead to chronic pain. If they're not managing their emotions and their thoughts, emotional, um, you know, emotions get trapped in the body. And then what happens is that emotional pain, hopefully not, but eventually can turn into an illness. So it's all about helping yourself be healthy. And of course, this is all connected, the mind, the body. And if I'm not managing emotions, thoughts, if I'm not regulating my nervous system, I can't ex expect myself to be healthy, right? Because we know today people, because they're in this constant state of stress, it can lead to burnout, it can lead to, de to depression, it can lead to anxiety, it can lead to um, mental and physical um, illness, right? So for me, understanding this is how the body works, the brain, I mean, it's all connected, it's all one, this is how I take care of myself, great. Because if I don't, know, if I don't have the knowledge, I can't do that. So that's the power in knowing, but you can't just know, you have to practice. So I encourage people to actually start doing the, the, the practices, the workouts. And soon enough, every individual realizes, wow, it doesn't take much. It's no rocket science. It's just a few deep breaths. It's just about noticing how my thoughts are, learning how to regulate my emotions or express myself or communicate. It's just a skill that can be learned. So... Yeah, and that's what keeps a person healthy. The breaking point for me was actually um, after my college experience, the research part, because I was so fascinated by it. And I, you know, so it was not just the research, but we did a lot of um, work. So with the Navy SEALs, Marines, we did the mindfulness practice. And I was just thinking, why do more athletes, more performers not have access to this? So for me, the breaking point was like, wow, so there's the research, there's the techniques, more people need to know this. And then because I do love people and I love working with people, I figured, you know, this should be my career from that point onwards. The first thing I would really suggest, and I know it's very basic and maybe some people are going to think oh, this is ridiculous, but this is what I'm about to say is the absolute foundation of all resilience, mental and physical well-being, and it's breathing. And people, as simple as it is, they never ever think about, am I aware of how I'm breathing and where am I breathing from? Because the, the foundation of all mental, st um, emotional stability, physical stability comes from deep belly breathing. And we have a diaphragm. We have a muscle here under our rib cage, a diaphragm. And when we, you know, inhale into our stomachs instead of our chest up here, when we inhale into our stomachs, people are scared to bring out their stomachs. They can bring them out as much as possible. Bring out the stomach and then exhale out from the stomach. So it's inhale and exhale from the stomach. And why from, why from the diaphragm? Because only when you exhale from your stomach, you activate the vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve is a nerve that travels all around your organs up to your brain. And it stimulates the parasympathetic nervous system. And it just tells you you're safe, you're okay. So every single day, people just really consciously need to communicate to their mind and body that they are okay, that they are safe. Because otherwise, the body is constantly sympathetic nervous system mode. It's okay. We need the sympathetic nervous system to get us going, to get us alert. But people that are overwhelmed, sleep deprived, tired, hungry, you name it, they never make sure their body just feels more at ease. And the only thing you can do, and that's what I ask you to start with, is just pay a little bit more attention to your breath. And if you do, I promise you, your life is gonna be so much easier. And if you're able to take two to three belly breaths from your stomach a day, your nervous system will calm down, you have better cognitive clarity, more emotional stability. People that 
are conscious of their breathing under stress, can make themselves present. And when you're present, you can stay focused for a longer period of time. And most importantly, just feel more at ease. So you need, people just need to be conscious of their breathing. And it's super simple. That's why I said the simplest thing to start. But yeah, you know, they don't do it. No, if you ask from 100 people, how many of you have taken a conscious breath today? That just means I was paying attention to my breathing. Two out of 100 usually raise their hands. The rest are like, breathing? Are you serious? What breathing? But the body, under stress, breathe, it breathes in its own rhythm. And if we're not aware of this breathing, the breath itself takes, takes you into a very anxious, destructive path. So just please, two breaths a day, just two. If you can do five, even better. <laughs> but deep belly breathing, yeah. Yeah, so if you look at it from that um, perspective um, of, you know, my sports career and now my career in the mental um, health, you know, which one is more difficult? From a responsibility perspective, of course, my new career now in, in, in the field of, you know, men mental performance is a little bit more, uh, I'll say, responsible because I know I have now an impact on people. They listen to me and... You know, and you, I, I'm, not say, I'm not saying things can go wrong, but for example, it can happen that maybe one of my performers doesn't necessarily have the results that, let's say, we would want the performer to have. So then it's a big responsibility on me to say, okay, clearly these, these uh, tools were not working for you. Maybe let's consider, and maybe it doesn't work again. I, I cannot say. I, my job is to do my best every single day. And I know that with my heart and soul and everything I have to give, there, there is most likely to be a positive change in that group of individuals or one individual. I understand it's a big responsibility, but I can only give my best. And if it's in my best, I have to say I'm happy with that. In swimming, it's the same, right? But just that, you know, it's not, I, I just swim for myself. Um, but still, if I give my best, then I walk away from the pool knowing I did my best. So, you know, I don't see it as more difficult or less difficult. I understand the responsibility aspects, but my job is to just do my best.